Well, welcome everybody to uh, uh, Swartz Creek Church of Christ. My name's Cody. We're involved in a study in Hebrews. Hebrews, and presently we're in the 13th chapter. Do you have that little picture, Steve? I want to show you all this little picture. That's Now, Steve said, if you get to show your G-babies, I get to show mine. And so this is Steve Gooden's grandbaby. That's Megan and Donald. That's just, they just happen to be the parents. Nobody cares about them. There's the baby. <laughs> Megan and Donald actually thought they were important, and then they had a child, and now they will find out how really unimportant they are because nobody will care anything about them. So. <laughs> when was it born? Was uh, born, Steve? Uh, Thursday. Thursday. And we got to wait. Yeah, she's, 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 she's weighing good though. Okay. And her name is Gabriella? Gabriella. All right. Okay. Well, good for her. Good for Megan and Donald. And, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get to see them. And they come to church this morning. Are we going to be in church this morning? I don't think so. Okay. Well, they better be watching on live stream, right? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Good. They're watching on live stream. So. God bless you guys, and God bless the baby. Y'all are unimportant. So, okay. All right. Uh, let's uh, start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful this morning as we come to you, thankful for our wonderful blessings. Father, we ask that you continue to look down upon us and continue to bless us because you are an awesome and wonderful God. And even if we receive no other blessings, Father, you are still an awesome and wonderful God. Father, we ask that as we study your word this morning, you help us to learn more about you, more about your character and nature, more about uh, how you would have us to live. And Father, more importantly than that, we apply that to our lives. Father, we are uh, just thinking of all the other people in, in this building today who are studying your word, be with them, be with the teachers and be with the students. Father, we ask you to also be with those who are watching via live stream and father we just uh, continue to pray for COVID-19 it has affected so many people in so many different ways and father uh, we just ask you to uh, continue to be um, with us in that situation help us to uh, use this to your advantage and further your kingdom father we pray this morning as we uh, continue on we pray for our country, we pray for our leaders, and Father, we pray for all those who have rule and authority over us, and Father, we thank you for being the wonderful God that you are, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We are in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, 13th chapter, uh, titled this, A Call to Perseverance. One of the things we've been talking about is them holding on, holding firm to the uh, the the doctrine that they had there and um, oh I gotta turn this thing on that I turned it off and now it's on and there we go back in my introduction you remind, may remember that I, I I said to you that uh, imagine that you were in a system where your beliefs culture family and identity were wrapped up in a particular belief now you believed in the risen Savior and you have none of those things that you used to have that were a comfort to you in fact, now you're being persecuted and may face uh, death, loss of businesses, loss of new friends or associates. And the writer of Hebrews is going to explain how Christ is better. He's superior. He's superior to angels, to Abraham, to the temple. In fact, to anything that you can think of, the writer of Hebrews has explained how Christ is better. In fact, I, I came up with a, this fictional couple, Moshe and Naomi, who... Uh, to kind of encapsulate that thought process. And what I've tried to do with Moshe and Naomi is try to get them, try to get you to understand, to think about them as they've been, we've been going through this process and, and how uh, they heard this letter the first time and how we hear it. And the idea is that Moshe and Naomi grew up in, this, in the Jewish religion. All of the things that, that we kind of know about, they knew intimately. 
the temple they knew about, the sacrifices they knew about, the priesthood they knew about, the order of Melchizedek they knew about. They knew about all those things and they knew about all those things intimately because they, they were practicing part of that. And now they, they've heard about this Messiah, they've heard about this risen Savior, and now they've been baptized, they've come to believe in Jesus, and, and the writer of Hebrews goes through all of those things are great and wonderful and awesome, but they are nothing compared to Christ. And so he's been talking about that. Faith, chapter 11, we talked about faith. Chapter 12, we talked about hope. In chapter 13, we're going to talk about love. In chapter 11, they talked about their privilege. Chapter 12, progress. In chapter 13, practice. Now putting that all into practice. And it's, it's something if you have, if you're getting persecuted because of Christ, but now it makes a difference how you react to that. How you, how you behave toward that. Some people get persecuted just because they get persecuted. If you are persecuted for Christ's sake, and you come through that, it helps you the next time. It helps you better the next time. It helps you as a person, all right? It helps you as a Christian. There are some people, I had an incident this week where I ran into one of my old uh, bosses, <clears throat> and use that term loosely um, and uh, and she tried to throw a scripture at me she threw a scripture at me and I was reminded that the devil quotes scripture so I wasn't too faced by that because I know I know the rest of her character and so I, I, my reaction to her was tempered not only with what I said, but the way I said it and how I said it. And the thought that I had with her was not bitterness or anger, which is, I certainly could have had that. But the thought I had with her was trying to get her to understand she needs to quit doing what she's doing and she needs to live a different way. And so um, it, if you're persecuted for Christ's sake, then your reaction to that, your, your putting that into practice, plays a big part. All right, so let's, let's take a look at chapter 13 here, and, and we'll see that as we, as we go along today. Uh, chapter 13, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Verse four, marriage is honorable among all the bed, among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Verse 7, remember those who have the rule over you, who have spoken the word God to you, whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey those who have the rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as though who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. 
Verse 18. Pray for us. For we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought you up from our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the, the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his good will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear over the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in a few words. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see if he comes, see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you, and all the saints, those from Italy greet you. Grace be to you all. Amen. Notice, uh, as, we were, as we were going through that, if, you've been, if you paid attention at all, a lot of the themes that we were talking about, he kind of uh, uh, hit on there at the end. And we'll talk about that as we go through. So a lot of the things that, that he's covered in chapters, well, he didn't write in chapters, but in the first portion of the, the letter, chapters 1 through 12, as we break it down, he's, he kind of he hit on the, a little bit of those themes, r reminding them of those themes as, as uh, he's ending the, the letter. Now, uh, we're going to go through this uh, uh, as, our, as our regular way is um, and look at it verse by verse. So let's look at it. Brotherly love, he covers in the first six verses. And he says, let brotherly love continue. So two things we notice about here. First, he says, let brotherly love continue. What does that tell us about the brotherly love that they've been having? Well, yeah, they've been doing it, okay? So they, they've been having brotherly love. He said, well, let, let it continue, okay? And notice on my, my chart there, I, I kind of have a, a triangle. And God is at the top of the triangle. And he sends love to us, and, and we send love to others. Now, uh, you, I can't, you, I don't know if you can see it very well. First Peter 1 Peter 1.22 says, since, says, since you have purified yourselves in obeying the truth uh, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. One of the things that that we tend to do um, as, as people is that when pressure comes on us, we hunker down into, into our little our little areas. We kind of did that during COVID. We all we all shut ourselves off. We we you know we we you know, closed up the windows and stayed inside the house and, you know, every, everybody's inside, okay? And uh, if we all stay in here, it'll all be safe. And the, the problem with that is one of the things I think we have found out from COVID is that we need people. Yes? Everybody shake your head. Uh, I, I may be a lonely guy and want to live on Montana on my own ranch, not in Montana, but in Texas, you know, my own ranch one day. But I, st I still need people. I still need folks, you know. Every now and then I just need a hug from somebody. Or I just need to, you know, I need to shake somebody's hand or just look at somebody besides me in the mirror, okay. And we need people. And God knows that. One of the reasons this family is important is because I want to know that I'm not the only one out there fighting the war. I want to know that I'm not the only one out there in the world trying to be a good Christian. I want to know that I'm not the only one out there. And when I come on Sunday morning and see you good folks sitting in the pews, I'm like, yes, I know there's some other good people out there. You are encouraging to me I hope I'm encouraging to you. And that's part of what we have to do. We, gotta, we have to do that. Part of the things with the brotherly love is we have to make sure that we help each other out. And, and he says, let that brotherly love continue. Just because you've got pressure from your side, whether it be, whether it be from outside sources or or, or the government or whatever. Just you, 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 look, don't let that stop you from you being who you are. 
Don't let that stop you from being the Christian that you know you should be. All right? I can still be kind in a world around me that's not kind. All right? Verse 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. The, the, the word there, the angels, are, are messengers from God. James 2.25 uh, refers, likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when we, she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Now that, that was an angels that Rahab, that Rahab entertained, but those were actually messengers carrying God's word. All right. The, the angels as messengers refers back to Genesis, the 18th chapter. What he's saying is, you never know who you're going to come into contact with. You, you, you never know who you might have an effect on. A psychologist one time said that everybody that you, have, that you come into contact with has an effect on you, you have an effect on them. Well, no, that's weird. How does my three-second interaction hey, how you doing, that I meet somebody at a conference, how does that have an interaction on me? Sasha, where are you from originally, Sasha? Ukraine. Ukraine. Sasha's from the Ukraine. I don't know if y'all noticed, but Sasha, like me, has a little bit of an accent. Okay? He doesn't sound like, he and me, he and I don't sound like the rest of you Michiganders. Okay? But when I, let's say I only meet Sasha for three seconds. There's a, he's a tall guy, bald head, wears glasses, got a little mustache there. What is that goatee thing called? Goatee, goatee thing, okay. Uh, I can't remember if it's a Van Dyke or whatever. It's just, okay. He got one of those and has a little bit of an accent. Now my mind clicks in on that and, and has all that stuff in there. So the next time I meet a tall, bald-headed guy with glasses, I'm not going to remember Sasha. But that good impression I got off him will transfer to that guy right there, and I, I won't even know about it. You don't know the interactions that you have with people. When Paul was talking to Corinthians, he said, Look, I, I watered. I planted. Well, Paul's watered. God gave the increase. You don't know the the few moments that you spend with somebody talking about the Bible or, or giving them a verse or, or doing whatever you're doing with them how that will affect them down the road I had a friend of, when, I was, when I was in the Marine Corps I was probably 23 24 and when we got to talking about religion one day and I, and I would you know and, and because I've been doing this for a long time and one of my buddies said to me he said uh he said, well, Cody, what do you guys believe? I said, well, we believe, you know, we preach where we, uh, we, we, we speak where the Bible speaks, silent where the Bible's silent. He's like, oh, okay. And I said that three, four, five times. 20 years later, 20 years later, I'm at a conference. I'm about, I'm about to get out of the Marine Corps here in about two years. 23 years later, his name was Shell Lehman. Shell Lehman walks up to me and he goes, Cody Melvin, speak where the Bible speaks, silent where the Bible silent. I didn't think that guy was paying any attention to me at all. In fact, I was pretty sure that he wasn't. And he remembered that. You never know who you, who you might entertain. You never know who you, who you might speak to, you, who it might have an effect upon all right. He says, remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Now, these aren't, these, now, knows, understand, keep it in context what he's talking about. He's not talking about people. He's talking about, not talking about murderers. He's not talking about, you know, all these kind of folks. He's talking about folks that are chained for Christ. Paul, Apollos, Timothy, these guys, that they, get, they got chained up for Christ. Silas, they got thrown in jail because they were preaching the word around the world today there are some Christians who are in jails in other countries that are there because they're preaching they're trying to preach the word 
Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Again, Matthew 7, 12 says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is, you know, do unto others as you would have doing them do unto you. But understand that these people, you may be in that situation one day too. When I was in Ghana on my mission trip, we got stopped by the local police. And of course, the local police, you know, you know, we're a bunch of missionaries. We just, we don't know anything, you know. And he goes, uh, why do you guys drive so fast? And they spoke brilliant English. They speak, spoke better English than I did. And I'm thinking, oh, I could be thrown in jail in a foreign country. It wasn't anything like that. They just... But he said, but you need to be careful because you might be in that situation also. Verse 4, marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Brotherly love that is genuine rules out marital infidelity. I can't say enough about how important it is uh, when people get married. How important it is to pick the right mate. To pick the right person. Because that person needs to help you get to heaven. That person needs to, to, you need to help get them to heaven. They need to help get you to heaven. And brotherly love isn't just brotherly love that I showed to Dan or Brother Tucker or any, anybody else. What that is, is brotherly love is love that I show to my wife and spouse also. Barbie said one time to me, she said, she said, don't you, uh, don't, don't you want somebody who knows the Bible? And I said, no, I got that, sweetie. I want somebody that, that can relate to other people. I'm not good at that. I know my deficiencies. People love her. They like me. They love her. Okay. And I'm all right with that. Okay. I walk into the building. People go, hey, where's Barbie? Oh, thanks a lot. Hi, my name's Cody. And that's okay. I'm okay. I'm all right with that. But I needed her to compliment me. That's why I'm having, picking the right mate is so important. Okay. Now. He says, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. I understand when I say this, that as I've said this many, many times before, I believe that God will forgive you of any sin. But you will suffer consequences from that. Nobody is a fornicator and adulterer and gets away scot-free. It just doesn't happen. It will not happen. Verse 5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Don't be selfish. Who do you trust? Do you trust in God? He quotes here, I will never leave you or forsake you. This is a, again, remember I told you the writer of Hebrews uses the Old Testament because that's what uh, Moshe, Naomi, and all these other folks he was writing to at that time were familiar with it. They, they knew the Old Testament. They had heard those stories. And he quotes here from uh, Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 8, and Joshua 1 and 5, where he, God tells Joshua, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he says, he says to them, look, do you trust God or do you not trust God? Don't be covetous. Don't be, be looking out there. You know, we gather up so much stuff. We have so much stuff. It is amazing how much stuff that we have. Go to a foreign country, any foreign country, almost any foreign country, and we have far more stuff than they do. You know our coats are bigger over here than they are in England? When you go to England, they can't believe, how, they're like Americans, they're like, how big of a coat do y'all need? I mean, 
Good grief. So huge. We have shows about people gathering stuff. That, you ever see them hoarder shows? Where they just keep stuff. We have a whole industry designed to put storage stuff in. In Michigan, we have these wonderful things called basements. So we can put more stuff in them. And, and I say this fully being aware that I have more things in my basement than you can shake a stick at. People don't go to my basement. I don't let people down in my basement because I got stuff. But don't be covetous. Don't say, man, I wish I had that. Oh, how big? Barbie said, do you want a, a bigger TV? I, you know, the manager of the Tigers is not going to go, hey, Cody, come in from the couch. You know, it's, I mean, I don't know how big the TV needs to be. I, I can see it. I'm not blind yet. Who do you trust? Where do you put your trust in? And, and that's the big deal about covetousness is because covetousness is really about are you trusting in God to provide you with your essential needs or do you got to have all this stuff to provide you with these comforting needs? Verse 6, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Again, if, if you're going through trials and trouble, tribulations, that is not the time to pull away from God. If you're going through troubles and trials, that is not the time, and he talked about this in chapter 7, that's not the time to start pulling away from God. Draw near to him. Somebody says they have lack faith. My question is, are, are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Cody, I'm short on faith. Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Are you listening to God's word? Or are you putting it in here? Because if it don't get in here, in here, it can't come out anyplace else. Hang on. Hold firm. That's what he's talking about. Verse 7, he says, Remember those who rule over you and have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Now, this passage is often taken out of context and misquoted, usually by fraudulent people trying to flaunt their authority. I've heard television evangelists use this as a way of saying, uh, this is God telling you to pay attention to me. And that's not what that verse is saying at all. If you, we keep it in context, he's saying the very same thing he said in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, imitate just what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. We look at their conduct. Considering the outcome of their conduct, what does their conduct say about them? What does their conduct say about how they're, how they're, they're leading, how they're, how they're teaching God's word? Verse 8, and then he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because Christ's conduct, Christ's character does not change. Christ is, is eternal. Christ does not change. His conduct and character is always the same. Today he is the same, and today his gospel is the same as first preached to the readers of Hebrews. In fact, it's the same um, for us some 2,000 plus or my years later. When we read this, when we read God's word, what we discover is the same thing that they told the Corinthians, the Ephesians, the Galatians, the Philippians, the Romans, all those, all those people back there. And that is the same thing we're preaching today. If we're looking at God's word and not adding man's word into it. Jesus doesn't change. Character doesn't change. 
right? Still speaks, still heals, comforts, provides, creates, restores, redeems, manifests. He is I am, not oh, I was. He doesn't change. Verse 9, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. One of the things about the Israelites where they were so caught up in the sacrifices, they did the sacrifices, and they did the sacrifices over and over and over. And he says, he goes, don't get caught up in that. He said, look, and he, and, he, and he makes the analogy in comparison here with taken off by various and strange doctrines. I don't know, I, I, I'm sure some of y'all can remember, but just in, in the past four or five years, there have just been these strange doctrines that pop up. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, everybody will get excited about this thing over here. And then everybody get excited about this thing over here. And it'll fade away. Everybody get excited about this thing over here. The religious world will get excited about this thing over here and it fades away. The religious world will get excited about this guy over here and it fades away. Hey, don't, don't, don't get carried away by these strange and, and various doctrines. Hold, hold to the old paths. You know, hold, 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 to what's, hold to what the Bible says. Hebrews 9, uh, uh, 9 says, Symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drink, various washings and fleshy ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Remember, the, the person who went into the holiest of holies had to first offer sacrifices for himself before he could go into the Holy of Holies. Verse 10. I'll put 10 and 11 together here. We have an altar from who, from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Now, he makes the comparison and an analogy here that a minister of the sanctuary and of true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. The Lord, Jesus, was the perfect sacrifice. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. But not only was the perfect sacrifice, he was the perfect altar, he was the perfect high priest. So not only was he the high priest who could enter into the Holy of Holies without having to offer sin for himself, and again, he talked about that back in chapter 6, 7, and 8, all right? But now he's saying, but now he says, not only was he the high priest, he was the lamb, the sinless, blameless lamb, and he was the altar. And unlike the old flawed system, the problem with the old flawed system was it could not atone for sins completely. That's what Jesus did. He's a minister of the sanctuary, of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Verse 12, therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Uh, on the day of atonement, on the Day of Atonement, the priest on that day would carry the burnt offerings and they would take them outside the camp. Normally, they would make the, 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 the offerings there and then they would burn it all up or eat it or whatever. On the Day of Atonement, they would take it outside the camp. By the very same token, Christ, when he was crucified, was crucified outside of the city gates. And he's making the comparison and the analogy between the two. The Day of Atonement for them was that high holy day that they all prepared for, that they got ready for. And so when they got ready for, the, the priest did something different. In that case, he's making the comparison between the two. Verse 13, therefore, let us go out forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse, for it is written, Curse is everyone who hangs on the tree. 
though the world points at us, it doesn't matter because we are going out to Christ. For as often as you drink of this, you proclaim Christ's death until he come. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, what we are telling the world is we don't care what you think. We believe that Jesus Christ lived, died, was buried, resurrected on the third day. And we're taking this memorial to tell you, to remind us, but also to tell you that we believe that Jesus is Lord. We're proclaiming to the world. And, and when we go forth, we go out. And anything that, that is involved with Christ, okay, fine, no problem. You don't like him, that's okay, I don't care. I'm still following the Lord. Verse 14, for we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Remember how we talked about how we're strangers, we're aliens, we're pilgrims. We are just passing through, folks. This is just temporary lodgings for us. It seems like a long time because we're, we're here a long time. For us, time is a thing. 60 years seems like a long time for me. In some ways, 40 seems like, I'm like, how did I get to be 60? All of a sudden I'm 60. And now there are some folks who are, some of y'all are a little bit older than that. And I guess when I get to be 80, I think, how did I get to be 80? <laughs> and when I get to be 90, I go, I can't believe I'm 90. I can't believe I'm still here. And if ever I get to, if ever I, if I ever get to 100, I'll say, all right, Lord, let's go. <laughs> you know? Strangers and aliens, we're just temporary. This is all temporary. We're passing through. This is just a little while, and then we're gone. This is not the city that we're looking for. This is not the, we're, we're going to someplace else. As much as I love Texas, there's someplace better than Texas. I know that's hardly for y'all to imagine, but there's someplace better than Texas. Verse 15, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to him. All right? So again, when you see therefore, all right, see what it's there for, right? All right? Let us continually to offer praise. Now, we don't offer just praise when we're singing, all right? But I just put that little image up there, all right? We also offer praise when we, when we talk about Christ, when we, when, we, when we pray to him, when we thank him, all right? Hebrews 7.25, therefore he is also to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intersection, intercession for them. 10.22, we, we've read this before. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So because we are moving toward that city, let us then offer continual praise to him. If things go well, we offer praise. If things go badly, we offer praise. If things work out of the job, we offer praise. If things don't go well, we offer praise. I have always believed that things are going to work out for me. Things have not always gone well in my life. I know it's hard to believe by looking at me. But things have not always gone well in my life. But I've always thought things are going to work out well for me. Because, not because... Not because of anything special, but because I love God. And even if, I, even if something, even if I were to die, I'm not worried about that because I know that I have a home with him in heaven. Because I'm following his word. And I can have that assurance because he's told me. And I can draw near to him because he's told me that I can. 
I'm not tied down to this place right here. I'm not tied down to this city. I'm not tied down to this, the frailties of this human world. I've got a home in heaven. Where are we at? Okay. Oh, goodness. Okay. Very well. Verse 16. But do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. The word there, the Greek word there is koinea. That's the Christian fellowship or communion with God or more commonly with fellow Christians. All right? I'll put that little sign up there. One day, you'll, you'll be just a memory for some people. Do your best to be a good one. Especially to those of the household of faith. Especially to those of the household of faith. To do good and to share. For with such, and look what he says here, sacrifices, God is pleased. Most of the time when we do good or we share, it's not too much of a sacrifice. And then he, and he's going to end with final words. I, I want to, I want to, we got about five minutes. And I, I don't want to rush through this, the final words, because there's a great, there's a great piece in that final word right there. And I don't want to uh, go too fast uh, over those. But I do want to, I do want to bring it up here. Uh, quick. Uh, so, two weeks from now, two weeks from now, we will start the the book of the letter to the letter written by James. Okay. Uh, so, if y'all want to go ahead and read uh, concerning that, we'll start James uh, after we finish this class. But we'll do that in two weeks because again, I don't want to rush through the last little part here uh, because there's some really good stuff here at the end. And, and we can do a, we'll do a review next week. I kind of planned on that anyway. So, um, so next week we'll talk about the final words and review. And then the week after that, we'll start James.